For Karima Media's Polity, I'm Sashni Midley. Joining me today is DA leader John Stienhazen, here to unpack his party's manifesto ahead of the crucial 2024 elections. The Democratic Alliance recently launched its manifesto, or its plan to save South Africa. And one of the biggest points you made was the abolishment of cater deployment. So if the DA comes into government, what processes will you follow to ensure that people you trust are in key government and SOE positions? Well, I think the first important point to make is that cater deployment has actually hollowed out the state to the point that you have state mining companies that cannot mine, state airlines that cannot fly, state electricity generators and suppliers that cannot generate or supply electricity. So it, it is hollowed it out, so the practice has to come to an end. We've committed that in the first 100 days of office, we would pass through Parliament the end cater deployment bill, which will start the move towards a professional civil service, free of political involvement, tasked by a independent public service commission that makes appointments into it with no political interference. I believe fundamentally, and it's our party philosophy, that if you appoint the right people into the right position for the right reasons, you'll end up with the right results. And that's why the proof of the pudding is in the eating in places like the Western Cape. Every provincial government department has a clean audit. The city of Cape Town, it's got its umpteenth clean audit. Midval, umpteenth clean audit. And this is as a result of putting the best people into the job, regardless of their political affiliation. So we don't, like the ANC does, look at the part person's loyalty to the party to determine whether they are appointed into a position. We say, who is the best engineer? Who is the best electrician? Who is the best director for this job? And they're appointed. And that is why we continue to deliver great results in government. Now, your party also plans to use grants and social services to lift 6 million people out of poverty. Is this fiscally viable, and how is it different from current government policy? Well, we, we, we believe that in a country with the socioeconomic problems that South Africa bears, and with such a stubbornly high unemployment rate, you have to have a social safety net, because that little bit of money is the difference between a citizen surviving or starving. And you can't burden the health system with, with the malnutrition, with uh, people who are starving to death. You need to be able to provide some assistance to them to be able to put food on the, on the table and feed their families. So we see the grant network as important. However, the grant network in itself and the social uh, safety net in itself is not the solution. We've got to get people into work. Uh, the social grant currently is not enough to feed families, it's below the food poverty line, which is why one of our recommendations was to lift it up by 250 Rand to the food mm -hmm. poverty line. But you've got to get people into work, and that can only come through growing the economy, attracting foreign investment, and making sure that we maximize local investment in the economy, and that we make it easy for people to be employed, mm -hmm. which is why our three, we, we've proposed converting the 350 Rand social relief grant into a work seekers grant. So that payment will continue provided you can prove that you're attending job interviews, that you're actively seeking work. So you don't then become just a passive recipient of services you get and, and assistance. You're getting assistance, but it's towards you getting a job. Because the best way to deal with inequality, the best way to deal with poverty is to create jobs, lots of them, and give people the dignity of work. The DA is calling for decentralization of powers in the areas of electricity generation, trade, and policing. Um, what is the DA's rationale for this call, and can you update us on the provincial powers bill that your party is spearheading? So our, our philosophy is that the era of big state-owned monopolies is over. We left that behind in the 1980s. The world has moved on. Internationally, you find very few state-owned monopolies anymore in any of the advanced economies and certainly the emerging economies and you have to let go of that state control so that you can bring the private sector into play in that arena creating more competition driving down price and improving efficiency let's use Eskom for example it is a state-owned monopoly we are entirely reliant on one facility Eskom to provide and generate and supply electricity when they fail the entire country is now at the mercy of it if you had a variety of players in the energy space, they could have picked up the slack. So we have to break these state-owned monopolies and allow public-private partnerships, independent power producers, to come in and start to assist uh, in that sector. The ports is another example. 
international successful ports the world over are all public-private partnerships or privatized. That's where you've got companies like Dubai Ports World, uh, the uh, Rotterdam guys, the guys from Hamburg, they specialize in running efficient and effective ports. We've got a huge problem in South Africa. We can't import goods and we can't get goods to market. We've seen the huge backlogs, places like Durban. You need those private sector players to come in and assist clearing backlogs, making sure you have an efficient and effective port system so we can get our goods to market and the materials that we need to help grow our economy here. Um, we believe that devolution of power is the best way to achieve these things as well. That if you have centralized control, it reduces in efficiency, it drives up the cost of corruption, it's overly bureaucratic. Devolving things like policing, devolving things like ports, devolving things like transport to local and provincial government, we believe will make a significant difference. And it's not just theory. If you look at what we've been able to do in the Western Cape around crime, now, policing is a national function, but we as a day can't sit back and watch police stations existing in an under-equipped way. So we've put resources in it as a province and a city to boost uh, policing in the areas through the LEAP program. It's put over a thousand police officers on the street, and they are reducing crime. Policing the world over is done at a local level. If you want to fight crime, you've got to empower local crime-fighting initiatives. You can't hammer the square peg of a nationalized policing plan into the round hole that is the Western Cape or the rectangular hole that is the KwaZulu-Natal. Each province has its own unique crime patterns and crime problems. And the more localized you make the policing, the more effective it is at being able to really deal with crime. And the updates on the provincial the Powers, Bill. Bill. Powers Bill is currently at the public hearing stage in the Western Cape. We believe it's a pilot and we are hoping it, uh, to get it through because we believe it's the first time in post-democratic history that we're now going to breathe life into the constitutional provisions of greater uh, power at a provincial level. We can devolve any power currently at a national level down to province or local government without having to change a single aspect of the constitution. It doesn't even require amendment. It's there. I think it's section 99 in black and white. Any power can be devolved. But what we need to do is to, is to start creating awareness around why this needs to take place. I think the Powers Bill is the first assertion by a provincial government to fully assert and breathe life into its powers provided by the Constitution. And I've no doubt after this next election, when we're in government in provinces like KwaZulu-Natal, like Gauteng, and potentially the Free State, and of course the Western Cape, that we will use that bill as a model to drive through in those parliaments so that those parliaments can really take control over the levers that they require to move to get an economy moving, to get jobs being created, to have a different approach to energy, to empower policing. Those are the things that, that make the biggest difference in people's lives and we have to get them moving. Now you mentioned energy. Uh, low shedding is obviously a big issue in South Africa. What are some of your plans? You mentioned some of them. And do you think changing the leadership of ESCOM will help? Yes, I do believe it will, it will change. Um, I think ESCOM is the wrong model, though. Um, I've spoken about the state control. I don't believe that a state monopoly is the answer to the energy crisis in South Africa. I think it has created the crisis in South Africa. And so if we're going to end it, we have to break the monopoly. We have to break ESCOM up into generation and supply companies. And they need to compete with other independent power producers, entrepreneurs, innovators in the space to be able to, to bring that competition. So we're not reliant on a single source who can charge us what they like because they're the only supplier. And they must be the only com uh, company in the world that's currently telling people, please don't use our products um, because they're dealing with load shedding. Load shedding lies at the heart of our very, very poor economic growth in the country. You cannot attract investment when you can't put power into the grid, into businesses, into factories, into manufacturing enterprises. So we have to get on top of it. We believe in opening up the sector, as I've already said, letting more players in. But we're also doing a number of things where we govern that we believe are fundamental to changing the game around electricity generation and supply. And that is that you've got to incentivize people to move to rooftop solar. It's quite expensive to do so. There are capital outlays. 
And one of the things that we've piloted now in the Western Cape and the city of Cape Town particularly is the creation of what we call prosumers. And these are people who produce <laughs> electricity on solar panels. It powers the operation and what they need. And they're able to sell excess power now back into the grid. So they're incentivized to do it because they will recover the costs. Now, the city in this last year alone has paid around 26 million rand to prosumers uh, for what they've been able to put back in the grid. What this does is relieves the, the pressure on the, on the ESKIM system, which means that you have less stages of load shedding. Uh, and this is just one of the ways. Other ways, tax breaks on, on solar panels so that you make it uh, incentivize people to put them up. Drop all import tariffs on p photovoltaic panels so that you can make them cheaper here in South Africa. And then, of course, you know, getting other companies into the arena so that we have this competitiveness. You saw what happened to cell phone prices when you had three or four players as opposed to one. Prices came down. Competition came down. Service improves because customers go where they get the service. The same should happen with our energy sector in South Africa. And we should never, ever, ever again be reliant on a single generation and supply capacity in the country. We should spread it a lot, uh, as, as much as we can so that we are able to drive down prices and ensure sustainability of supply. Now, your manifesto also sets out a list of ways to deal with crime and corruption. And some of these um, include the protection of whistleblowers, lifestyle audits, a new police watchdog, and getting rid of the hawks. Mm. So under a DA government, uh, how will these interventions help? Mm. Well, I think getting rid of the hawks is important because you need to replace it with the scorpions, 2.0 as we're calling it. And this time we're saying there should be a Chapter 9 institution, so they'd require a 75% majority to get rid of them. The last scorpions were so successful that a 95% conviction rate, but they had started to get too close to the politicians at the top of the ladder, so they were quickly disbanded in a political decision. We need to bring them back because they were the first multidisciplinary task team in the country that brought together investigators, um, lawyers, advocates, prosecutors, forensic accountants, all who were able to build cases, which is why their conviction rate was so good. We need to bring them back immediately. We need to make sure that we update and bring our police service into the century. We're still policing in a Victorian way. I don't think we're nearly leveraging the technology that's out there. Drone technology has, has moved on massively. And particularly in rural policing, you could have an eye in the sky with, through a drone over large tracts of, of rural land where stock theft is a problem, where remoteness is a problem, which allows you to use your resources far smarter. Instead of having vans patrolling in very difficult areas, you're able to have the drones going over, they pick something up, they can pinpoint the problem, they can then track the problem until a van or the, an intervention can take place. The most high-tech piece of equipment in most police vans is the CB2 air radio, if it's working. We've got to get policing into the modern era and take advantage of that technology, and we've got to end cater deployment in the police. We've got to make sure that we're putting qualified police personnel, people who have experience in fighting crime, into the top positions so that they can get on with the job. Policing is not uh, something that just comes naturally. It is a science. And you need the, the right people leading the organization to be able to get it there. We have a cowboy now as the police minister who goes around in a cowboy hat from one crime scene to the next, flitting here and flitting there. That's not how you deal with crime. You deal with crime scientifically, systematically, and systemically. And that's where the reform is going to have to be focused after the election. If we're going to end this terrible spate of 75 people being murdered every single day in the country. To fix the economy, the DA proposes overhauling the tax system. Can you explain to us the party's plans in this regard? Uh, we have one of, the, one of the highest tax burdens in the, in the world. And a very small population size pays tax in this country. So what we need to do is to make sure that the tax system is more efficient and effective. It's able to identify people who are exploiting loopholes, like putting dollars under their couch, etc. Uh, you need to be able to deal with that. You need to deal and make sure that corporations and businesses are paying their fair share of tax. And we've got to increase the pool of taxpayers in the country. And the only way you do that is by creating more jobs and, and make it easier for people to find work 
so that we grow the taxpaying base in the country. That way you're able to share the load far more proportionately amongst a bigger group of people and lower the tax burden. I believe we can turn South Africa as well into a tax haven of sorts for international agencies, but we've got to be innovative and clever in the way that we think ar around taxation in the country. There's a reason why large corporations in South Africa are relocating to Mauritius and to other African countries with much less burdensome tax regimes because those countries are using a lighter tax burden as an incentive to attract that investment. And I think we're being left behind. And if we continue on with the draconian form of taxation that we have, we're going to continue to squeeze the pips out of the, the current taxpayer system and you're going to end up then repelling big corporations, big money onto overseas stock markets and relocations to other countries. And that's the last thing we need in South Africa right now. Now, under a DA government, what are the plans for primary, secondary and tertiary education? Well, I think that there's been an overwhelming focus on on higher education and secondary and, 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 and secondary education. I believe the focus needs to be shifted to early childhood development and primary school education because that's where the foundations are laid. You can't fix a system that's broken at the tertiary level. You've got to fix it right at the start of the pipeline. So I'm glad that ECD has now been moved back to the education sector, but you've got to fix that pipeline that's running through the, the, through the system. We also believe that what South Africa lacks is a huge amount of skilled uh, workers in the country, people with real skills, vocational skills. And that's why we're saying that it's at the, uh, at the uh, grade nine level, there should be a greater opportunity for differentiation for people to be able to leave the traditional academic stream and to go into fitting and turning, boiler making, tiling, electrical work, electrical engineering, um, mechanical engineering, those types of fields um, and, and help grow the skills base. Because the reality is, you know, we're never going to fix the country if everyone's a white collar worker. You need blue collar workers with the skills to be able to drive your economy and you need to make sure that both of those streams are treated with the same amount of respect and remunerated properly. This is how advanced economies like Switzerland and Germany operate. The accountant at a big motor manufacturer in BMW is on the same package as the head of engineering at the, in the department. So you're creating an incentivization for people who want to follow vocational services, the opportunity to do so far earlier rather than keep them trapped into an academic stream for which they perhaps don't have an aptitude and struggle with, but would be brilliant if they were able to follow their dream of being a mechanical engineer, a mechanic, a plumber, a fitter and turner, boiler maker. Now, the DA has also been opposed to the National Health Insurance Bill. Um, so what are your plans in terms of dealing with the challenges relating to high private health costs and crumbling public infrastructure. So we believe that that can be easily resolved if there's a focus on addressing the real problems. NHI will be a disaster. It'll essentially be ESKIM for healthcare. And I think that would be a terrible outcome and it would go the same way as ESKIM, Donnell, SAA, Portnet, Transnet. So you've got to find a way to marry the excellence that we have in the private sector with the problem that we have in the public sector. And I think this is another huge opportunity for public-private partnerships to take place. We've also put on the table, I believe, a very innovative plan about reinsuring, um, having a third tier of, of medical insurers that will then help drive down the costs and be able to spread the burden. We have put a plan on the table that would give universal access to healthcare to every South African who needs it regardless of their, of their income bracket, without destroying the excellence in the private sector, which the NHI seeks to do. The NHI wants to dumb the entire system down to the lowest common denominator. We're saying no, let's uplift the public system to the same level as the private, system, uh, private healthcare services, that way everyone gets a fair opportunity. But the only way you're gonna do that is if you're able to mitigate against the costs of private healthcare and we believe our reinsurance plan goes a long way towards doing that. Then again, focusing like a laser beam on primary health care. 
And this is where I would give some credit to the Cuban uh, system. I don't often give a lot of credit to the Cuban system. But the notion that you deal with primary health care, excellence at primary health care, at source in the community, reduces your burden on secondary and hospital uh, uh, health care. So you are able to then give people excellence when they go to a local clinic. Um, so it ensures that they do heal, they do get better, and they're not then required to be referred to a hospital down the line. And I think that there's, there's something there around investing in primary health care in the country so we can help keep our people uh, healthy, uh, well-fed, and we can deal with this malnutrition crisis that's stalking the country. As we head into what has been called a watershed election, um, the stakes are higher than ever for South Africans. So how will the DA navigate should the ANC fall below 50% of the votes? Would you be prepared to enter into a coalition with the ANC or would you confine your coalition um, options to the multi-party charter? Look, I mean, it's a difficult question to answer until you've seen the cards that have been dealt on the table. I mean, I can come up with a million hypotheses about what, what if. But I would say this, our focus, and certainly my focus, for the next 85 days is to get the parties in the multi-party charter over the line. I don't think it's healthy to have a, a party in government for more than 30 years. I don't think it's good for our democratic health. I don't think it's good for our economic health. And I certainly don't believe it's good for our socio-economic uh, fabric in the country. So I do think the ANC would do well to spend a bit of time on the opposition benches where they can reinvent themselves and for a new government to be able to uh, try some new policies and try to do things differently because goodness knows we need a change. Um, that being said, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, why don't you just do a deal with the ANC? Well, it's not that simple because who am I going to be sitting across the table with after the election? If the ANC falls below 50%, there's a very high likelihood that Mr. Ramaphosa would have to fall on his sword and go. You, he won't survive being the first ANC president to lose the ANC their majority. And that's how it works in politics. You know, leaders take responsibility for the outcomes of the election. So who am I going to be sitting across the table with? Is it Paul Mashatile, who's now embroiled in this huge corruption scandal and seems to be involved in, in graft and the like of epic proportions? Is it Fakile Mbalula? It's very hard to take seriously. Uh, you know, or is it some other radical faction there? So we'll have to assess after the election, having a look at the cards that have been dealt to us, what the next move would be. I mean, obviously, we'd consult with our friends in the multi-party charter, say, well, what do we do now? We, you know, we haven't made it over the 51% mark. What should we do? And of course, to go back to my own party and our voters and say, this is the hand that you've dealt us. You know, can you give us some guidance about how you want to play? But I have said right from the very beginning, and I want to be clear about this, that I think it would be a disaster to see the ANC, the EFF, or the ANC and MK, or ANC, EFF, MK, getting into the union buildings, because I think you would have overnight disinvestment, overnight loss of confidence in the economy. I think you would see a huge problem with um, capital flight out of South Africa as people panic that we're heading down the Venezuela or Zimbabwe route. And you'd want to avoid that at all costs. And so, you know, we may be forced off the election to look at what are the least worst options. And that may include entering into talks with various people. But as I say, my focus for the next 85 days is on getting the DA and the multi-party charter over the line. Because that's first prize for South Africa. Now, we've seen coalitions in metros and municipalities crumble. What assurances can you give that if we work at a provincial and national level? I think that's a really good question, and it's, it's an important one. Um, I would say, if I look at the, at the metro coalitions, particularly in Gauteng, remember, there was no planning going into the election. The election results were there, the cards were dealt by the voters, and we literally had 14 days to make a decision about how we would put something together. It's not enough time. And I think that's a large part of the instability there, is that we didn't spend enough time, we didn't have enough time being able to put together solid agreements, concrete plans, dispute resolution mechanisms. And that's why I felt it was important that I announced the, what was called at the time the Moonshot Pact in April last year, precisely to give us a runway of a year to be able to iron out these problems, to talk about what are the common policies. Where are the differences? How do we manage those differences? 
How do we come up with a coherent plan to put before voters that says we're not just an anti-ANC grouping, we're actually a pro-South Africa grouping and here's our agenda for change. And I think it's made the world of difference uh, in being able to have this preparation. And I think that when we do end up on the 29th with the result, I think the multi-party charter can move very quickly to sign a coalition agreement because we've front-loaded a large part of the, the hard work that had to be done. I do just want to make one point about, final point about municipal coalitions. It's very easy to look at coalitions through the lens of Johannesburg and Twane and Ekoleni. And I think that would be an unfair analysis of coalitions. We're involved in over 25 coalitions around the country. They bring good, clean, accountable, stable government to places as diverse as Richards Bay and KwaZulu-Natal and Saldana Bay in the Western Cape. You don't hear about them in the media, they don't make a lot of noise because they're getting on with the business of running good, clean, accountable government. Um, and so, to, you know, people I always say must be wary of throwing the coalition baby out with the Johannesburg bathwater. There are some significant problems in Gauteng particularly, and I think these are lessons that voters will have to carry with them into the ballot uh, box in this next election and take with them into the voting booth. And that is when you over-fragment the vote, you make it impossible to form stable coalitions. So let's take Joburg, for example. 18 political parties. 11 of those 18 parties have less than 1% of the vote. It is impossible to put a stable coalition together in such a fractious and diluted environment. So voters need to think very carefully in this next election and make sure they vote for parties with established track records with a history of getting things done and who are serious about being able to build strong workable coalitions going forward. Because what you don't want to do is have the spread betting, you know, every little small party gets a vote approach at a national provincial level because you will have chaos, the same chaos you've seen in Johannesburg being replicated at potentially a provincial and potentially a national level. And we must avoid that at all costs. So. Voters must consolidate their vote around the parties that they truly believe will be able to come together and form a stable government afterwards and not betray the wishes of the voters by selling their votes off to party X or party Y. Just one more point on coalitions. Do you think we need new legislation? Yes, I do. I do think we need new legislation and, and that is why our chief whip in Parliament, Saviwe Gahube, has tabled a number of bills which we call the coalition stabilization bills. The reality is that any proportional representation system will ultimately end up in a coalition. If you look in Europe, if you look in South America, you look in, in, in other parts of Africa, in other parts of, of the world, where you have a purely proportional system, it ends up in coalitions. And they've obviously matured a lot sooner than we did, and they obviously had a lot longer time to do it. But they've got a variety of mechanisms in there. So a number of those countries, in fact, almost every country with a proportional system has a threshold, so of ranging between 2% to 10% that you have to get before you get into the legislature. And this present, prevents that over-fragmentation that you've seen in Johannesburg. I think we need to look at limiting the number of motions of no confidence you can bring in a year, because I think you have to have stability of government, and I think that a year is sufficient time establish some form of stability and I do think that you need to be able to make coalition agreements registrable and publicly available and, I, and one of the, the solutions we put on the table is to follow the Kenyan model of having a registrar of political parties where your coalition agreement is then lodged with the registrar. Should a party want to exit that coalition agreement they would have to make the case why the coalition agreement has been breached or why they want to leave. So it wouldn't be this revolving door politics where you see one party bring out a checkbook and suddenly they can get people to switch sides and you bring this instability. What you need, what business needs, what industry needs, what manufacturing needs, what investors need is stability. They don't mind a little bit of uncertainty and risk, but they want to see stability. And the sooner we can give them that, I believe the sooner there will be greater confidence in the investor environment and the industry, industrial environment in South Africa going forward. 
Lastly, John, there is a proliferation of small parties mm. that seem to be, some of them seem to be going for the DA's base. Mm. Um, why should voters vote for your party when there are these alternatives? Yeah, I think another excellent question. Um, look, I, I think that you, there's over 300 and something parties now registered with the IEC. And I think we're going to get a ballot sheet. I think we're going to get a ballot book at the election when you, when you go there. Um, but I would just make this point is that anybody can come in a nice shiny suit with a nice glossy manifesto with a laundry list of things that they're promising. Voters have to ask themselves two important questions. Firstly, does this party have a path to victory? I mean, in other words, can it get into a position of power where the things it's promising in the manifesto are going to come to fruition? And secondly, does it have a track record of delivery or is it a track record of just making promises? And I think those two questions are going to be fundamental to voters in this election. And the first thing you should ask a, po a, a politician that arrives on their doorstep is what is your path to victory? Because I may like your manifesto, I may think you're a cool guy and you've got a snappy suit, but if I vote for you, how do I know you're actually going to get into power? And that's the beauty of the multi-party charter, because for the first time ever in 30 years, there's now a path to victory. It's not an easy path and it's not a certain thing and it's not a guarantee, which is why I called it a moonshot originally. Um, but it is a path for the first time. And I think that voters need to look at the parties in the chart and, and know that these are parties that have a clear path to victory. And then to, to look at the track record. The track record is important. The DA, for instance, hasn't just spoken about creating jobs. We created over 300,000 new jobs in the Western Cape in the last year alone. We haven't spoken about devolution and fighting crime. We've reduced priority crime 14% year on year in hotspot areas. Uh, we haven't just spoken about a good education system. Young people in the Western Cape are learning robotics and coding and the type of skills that would allow them to find work in the new world. And I think that those are the key things that people need to judge, uh, judge politicians by. And remember, in every election, there's shiny new baubles that pop up to distract. A hung cope, um, a good, you know, a whole variety of them. And you know, people voted for them, and pretty soon they just, you know, just disappeared. I think they need, you need to have a look, very close look at, is my vote in this election, which will be the most important election in post-democratic South Africa, going to count? And is it going to help get us over the line? And I think that once voters ask themselves that question, the story about some of these popcorn parties, I think, will, uh, you know, will start to, to make a little bit more sense to them. That was DA leader John Steenhazen speaking to Policy about the DA's policies ahead of the crucial 2024 elections.